how to improve your social encounters today on Dungeon Graph. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D and other tabletop role-playing games. And I'm Deathbringer. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon so you'll be informed when we upload new videos every week. Social encounters can be tough for a number of reasons. You got players meandering around, not knowing who to talk to or what to say. Players who think a natural 20 on persuasion or bluff or intimidate means they can skip over all the role playing. Then you have the groups that allow the character with the highest charisma to just take over, and the problem with characters with James Bond levels of charisma being portrayed by, well, let's just say there's a reason comic book guy is funny. So today I'm going to walk you through a scenario composed almost entirely of social encounters. I'll show you my notebook, how I plan, and how I keep my players on track. This is the fourth episode of my Veil Society campaign, loosely based on the Zeb Cook module of the same name, about three warring merchant families and a secret criminal organization that seeks to control the city. To run a social scenario, you need three key elements. One, location. A treaty negotiation, diplomatic dinner, garden party. In this case, it's a masquerade ball. Two, a clear objective. The player characters have to steal a rare bottle of wine. Three, you need to set the proper tone, making it clear this is a social event and characters can't just hack their way out. There are three warring merchant families in the city, the Rodimus, Munchburger, and Weissbier families. Every year, the patriarch of the Rodimus family, Anton Rodimus, throws an opulent masquerade ball. Now, Anton collects wines. The player characters, a gang of thieves, are hired by their mysterious contact, Goldface, to steal a rare elven wine. We'll call it the Amontillado, because I like literary Easter eggs. And it's kept under lock and key in Anton's wine cellar. If possible, they're to leave no trace of the theft, so no pile of dead bodies laying around. There are two keys to the wine cabinet. One is held by Rene, the head butler. The other is held by Anton Rodimus himself. But because he's in costume, no one knows what he looks like, so the players will have to roleplay to find him. The player characters will infiltrate the event in three teams. Team 1 will pose as guests. They will be provided with a forged invitation to the masquerade that admits two of them to the ball. Team 2 will pose as their driver and manservant. They will not be permitted to attend the ball, but can attend a separate party for the guest servants in the coach house. There, they must ingratiate themselves with the servants, gather rumors, and search for any secret entrances. The final character will infiltrate the staff using a forged letter of recommendation. It's a big party, so they need to hire additional staff for the evening. It's the perfect opportunity for any rogue. Now, because someone's going to ask, why doesn't the rogue just pick the lock? Because there are two locks, the standard cell key and a padlock. Same key, but since lock picking takes time and with servants constantly coming and going into the wine cellar, there's too great a chance for discovery. None of the characters are permitted to wear armor, weapons, or carry any magic items. It's a masquerade ball, not a military conclave. In a real medieval city, people were not permitted to wear armor or carry battle axes or ranged weapons around. A noble gentleman would be permitted to carry a rapier, and you can always sneak a hidden knife. But you can't clunk around in field plate, dragging a plus five Holy Avenger behind you. And now we have a location, clear objective, and defined limitations. Fertile ground for social encounters. Now how are they going to get the key and steal the wine? I don't know. As I said in my previous video, they're the protagonist. It's their job to protect. My job is to plan carefully so that no matter which NPC they talk to, I kind of know what they're going to say. But before that, let's discuss rules. There are actually rules for social encounters in the 5e DMG on page 244. NPCs can be categorized into three general attitudes, friendly, indifferent, and hostile. The DM decides the attitude of that NPC. Then the DM and players role play, and the DM decides whether the scale moves. No dice are involved, and you can only move one level per encounter, so it's possible to shift an NPC's attitude from hostile to indifferent, but not to friendly. The DM may allow players an insight check to get a glimpse into the motivations of the NPC, but this isn't mind reading, it's just a general impression. Players may glean that Anton is motivated primarily by greed and social standing. He aspires to move from wealthy merchant to minor nobility. The ball is his way of attracting young noble women in the hopes that he might marry one. When the players finally get to their point of what they're asking for, that's when the game master can require a charisma check. And that's when all the social skills like deception would apply. And it's worth remembering that a natural 20 doesn't mean, even with a friendly person, that they're always going to grant your request if it's against that character's nature. 
Anton, for example, is extremely greedy and loves his wine. He is never going to part with it, even if the players get friendly with him and roll a natural 20. He might show them the wine and brag about it that he got it for a good price, but he's not just going to hand it over to them. So remember, insight isn't mind reading, charisma isn't mind control, and the DM and the DM alone calls for all charisma checks. In a social scenario, preparation is key. In my notebook, I've sketched out the family trees of the three merchant families so I know all their names and what they import in case anyone asks. Everything I need to run the scenarios are on these two facing pages to eliminate flipping. I include a flowchart, map of the house, a list of NPCs present, and canned speeches, aka box text. The map is abstract. I'm not interested in exact dimensions. It's more like a flowchart. I'm interested in who is where and the points of access. Group 1 has access to the main room, library, gallery, and billiard room. The rogue, disguised as a servant, has access to those rooms as well as the kitchen, cellar, and these secret doors used by the staff to discreetly move about the manor. The final group can gamble with the other coach drivers or they can explore and find the secret door in the stables. This leads to the sub cellars, sewers, guard room, and the wine cellar. My flowchart helps me keep track of who's where. It's written as bullet points, so I can move from bullet to bullet, cutting between the groups, permitting everyone to watch, but not to comment or communicate, heightening the dramatic tension. The bullets include snippets of conversations the characters may overhear. They also include events that are initiated by the NPCs. At one point, Stefan Munchberger gets into an argument with Lucia Weisbeer, and she throws a glass of wine in his face, and they both storm off. And the next night, Lucia is going to be found murdered, and Stefan will be the main suspect. This is straight out of the module, and this scene establishes the tension between them. The canned speeches include Goldface, Anton, and a list of 20 rumors, some false, some true. I don't like reading box text, so I rehearse the speeches ahead of time so they seem natural and I don't leave out any critical information. I also spent some time developing character voices. So Wolfgang Rodimus I based on Tom Hulse and his portrayal of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in the film Amadeus. He's got this ridiculous over-the-top laugh, so I stole that for Wolfgang. And I based Anton on Jeremy Irons. I practice the voice like this, and I don't know if it sounds like Jeremy Irons to you, but it does in my own head, and that's the important thing. If it sounds like someone else in your own head, it will sound unique to your players. At one point, Marianne was wandering through the portrait gallery, and that's a trigger. That's when Anton approached her, and he said, I see you're admiring the portraits. Allow me to give you a tour. That's my first wife. Katrina Rodimus died too young in childbirth with my youngest son, Dieter. That's my second wife, Margaret. Such a lovely, jovial young girl, always talking and talking and joking and talking and talking. Sadly, she slipped and fell off a balcony. My third wife, Lucrezia, was much more silent. Didn't even speak the language. Probably my most beautiful wife, very popular with the young men. Died tragically, drowned in the backyard fountain. And there are several more. And the final portrait is of Marianne herself. Now, Anton doesn't recognize her, but he says, That is Marianne. She was to be my most recent wife. It was an arranged marriage. Her father sent the portrait in advance. But she never arrived. Her coach was ambushed by bandits and the dowry lost. But if I ever find who took it. But enough about me. Tell me about you. And I took this straight from the character's backstory. Maria, Marian's player, decided her character was a noble and turned to a life of crime because she faked her own death and absconded with the dowry. And I just wrote it into the plot. And there's several things going on here. First, I want to establish that all of Anton's wives were extremely young, very beautiful, and died under mysterious circumstances because he is a bad guy. He's a serial murderer. So I want to convey the idea that he's dangerous and that he is now looking for her, heightening the dramatic tension. And by rehearsing these speeches ahead of time, it makes the character seem more natural, more real, and it seems more like they're just conversing and it's not just a speech. So when did I call for charisma checks? Not a lot. 
Marianne is an attractive young woman who just asked this creepy old dude to dance. Why would he need to be persuaded? You don't need a die roll for that. You do need a die roll to pick the key from Anton's pocket, hand it off to the rogue, who will open the wine cabinet, pass the Amontillado to the other team, who will give the key back to Marianne, who will put the key back in Anton's pocket without him ever knowing. A charisma check is only necessary if there's a reasonable chance of failure. So put down the dice and put yourself in the headspace of your NPCs and just make decisions. At least that's how I handle social encounters. How do you do it? Well, you can put your ideas in the comment section below. Also below, you'll find a link to the Dungeon Craft Facebook and Patreon where you can get copies of my notebook pages and handouts, as well as a link to my module Macdeath which also features a number of social encounters. It's available exclusively at questgivers.com, link below. But don't go away. Check out more Veiled Society videos over here, and may all your rolls be 20s. Deathbringer again. I got the wine, and I want my 200 gold pieces. There was supposed to be zero body count. No one can count the bodies if there are no witnesses. Now click on these videos for more Dungeon Craft.